Hello, hello! Welcome back to Let's Talk HP Lovecraft. If you've not yet subscribed to our channel, please take a moment to do that now. All right, so we are down to the next to last HP uh, Lovecraft review in Medusa's Coil and others. Um, just one more story after this before we put this book on the shelf and move on to other things. But first, we have to get through this. This is in the wall or in the walls of Eryx. There's some confusion over what the actual title is. Is it walls, plural, or singular? Um, everywhere on, online, it seems to show plural. Um, in this book, it says just wall. And I tend to believe the the book, um, this has happened twice in this book, but the, the publisher is sort of the definitive Lovecraft scholar. So I'm guessing that the original title is probably The Wall of Eryx. Uh, but it was written by Lovecraft and Kenneth J. Sterling in 1936, but not published until 1939 in Weird Tales. Uh, synopsis, a man named Stanfield from Earth, part of a mining company, goes to Venus to, um, uh, to mine, um, a strange power producing crystal. Um, but these crystals are coveted by and protected by a man, lizard, hybrid, weird species, alien species, uh, who seem to have, um, uh, some sort of a, so a connection to it. And they always, always know where it is and where to find it. And they know if, People are tampering with it, and because of this, people have avoided their big cities and all that, and they're just out there um, mining these objects from the uh, from the wilderness. Um, Stanfield, our miner, um, he's located a pretty big one, one big enough to power the city of Chicago for an entire year. So he sets off through the jungle on his own uh, to find it, until he, um, at one point he gets close to it and. Uh, he sees it in the distance. He realizes there's a body clutching it um, in its dead, cold, dead hands, a human body. Uh, but he runs up against an invisible wall. And he searches along the edges of the wall until finally realizing there's an opening and he gets inside. Uh, the rest of the story is spent inside um, uh, this structure trying to get out. Uh, he makes it to the body, but he um, uh, picks up the crystal and uh, begins to take it away. Uh, but he finds himself lost in an invisible labyrinth or maze, and he, he's always fumbling along uh, these paths and these doors and these corridors, feeling his way, but always being able to see the decaying body of this man uh, who he's taken the crystal from. And um, along the way, uh, he begins writing about his troubles, um, trying to get out, uh, his plans, his methods, um, all the things that he tries to do, but he can't affect the surface of the, uh, the invisible wall. He can't dig under it. Uh, he can't seem to get around it in any sort of way. Uh, so he's growing uh, more and more weary. Uh, he's uh, using up his oxygen, his food, his water, and eventually some of the natives come to uh, to celebrate and gawk out, outside the edge of the rim of the, the structure and he realizes that he's fallen into a trap and that um, this species who originally he thought that we should just wipe out um, that way we could have access to all the crystal we, we want um, he realizes that he has vastly underestimated them and that they are a lot more um, perhaps intelligent than he is and that perhaps uh, maybe their species is more of the norm in the cosmos uh, than our species um, which uh, seems to be, you know, we're more um, obvious and intentional and we want wealth and we want power and they sort of just want their, to be left alone. Um, he, he goes on like this for days and uh, he's growing weaker and weaker and he's losing all hope for getting out and he's, um, he's written this account of his, uh, his activities and uh, you know, later in this journey he gets closer to the body than he's been in days but he can't get to it there's another invisible wall and uh, he's at the end of his rope and he lays down basically to die and to before that finish writing his account uh, but as he sort of blacks out um, he does think that maybe he saw a light from above um, that light from above um, is attached in a account by one Wesley Miller, uh, who is the flight leader on this crew that goes out looking for him, um, having tracked his path, his um, his mission. Um, they land the craft, but it's damaged because it hits the invisible wall. Um, but they get inside. Uh, they able to locate him and the crystal, and um, they realize that uh, he was only 22 feet away from the exit when he died from despair and exhaustion. Uh, but having read the account, which they attach to their account, to their, uh, to their report, um, they take 
um, Stanfield's advice and decide that, yeah, we're going to bring our army across from Earth and we're going to wipe out these damn uh, savages uh, because uh, there's bigger deposits and, you know, obviously they're setting traps for us so they can't be trusted and it's time to uh, do what humans do, which is to wipe anything they don't like out. <laughs> um... There is a whole lot of James Cameron's avatar in this story, but, it, but without the, um, uh, the warm and fuzziness of Avatar where we sort of relate to and love the, the natives and one of us becomes one of them. You know, this guy, he does come to respect them a little bit more, um, having underestimated them, uh, but ultimately it's going to lead to them being wiped out, much as, again, is the case in the movie Avatar. Um, but it's pretty cool. Um, this is a Lovecraft story where we actually go physically into space. Um, there's a lot of uh, cases in Lovecraft where somebody's spear or their soul gets transported far, far away across the cosmos. Uh, but I can't think of any other story where somebody actually goes space traveling in their physical form. So that was pretty cool. It makes it feel more like a traditional sci-fi story than any of the other Lovecraft stories that we've seen. Um... Um, but, of course, it, it's also interesting because uh, being a story from the 30s, it does have that old sci-fi um, feel to it where um, we didn't know what we know about now about space travel. So this guy's um, he's on a, a Venus that is filled with lush green jungles, which was how it was commonly depicted in a lot of, um, a lot of stories those days. Um, um, and he's using... Um, a mask that you put a cube in it and it dissolves and it turns, creates oxygen and the same thing with water and there's food, um, uh, food tablets that you basically eat and drink and it expands in your stomach. So all kinds of really interesting old tropes that are common to those days. And it, it does show its age because of that. Uh, but at the same time, I really like this. Um, it would make a great weird movie. Um, I'm reminded of the recent movie where those people get lost in that cornfield and it's like this giant maze, and but it's also part of some sort of government program um, <laughs> that they've been sort of uh, lured into as like test subjects. So it reminds me very much of that type of situation. Uh, but really what it's all about is um, it's about despair and pers versus perseverance. And this guy uses all of his intelligence and all of his wits, and he tries to methodically work through this problem day after day. Um, but even having uh, used his wits and his human ingenuity, uh, eventually uh, everybody um, or people eventually find themselves in a position of complete despair. And that's sort of Lovecraft in a nutshell, um, sort of this, this idea of the, um, the cold, calculating, uncaring cosmos in which humans are just a... Um, uh, just a nuisance and an afterthought and don't even register on the radar of greater beings. And uh, this sort of distills all of that into a bit of a nutshell, which I quite like. And it's sort of a different way uh, than, the, than the rest of Lovecraft's stories of depicting that scenario. Um, yeah, um, I'd highly recommend this one. It's pretty good. Um, I would love to see it as a movie, though. That'd be awesome. How do you depict the invisible walls? That's another question. Um, maybe you give them a little bit of a tint, uh, perhaps, so we have something to uh, to base our, um, our, our perceptions on. Um, but, of course, it would be then invisible to the actor, I would suppose. Uh, but pretty cool. Um, highly recommended. Um, take you about an hour and 15 minutes to read. Be sure to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, the Walls of Eryx from Lovecraft and Kenneth J. Sterling, written in 1936. So I'd say pretty far ahead of its time. Um, all right, uh, down to that last story next time, The Night Ocean. So be sure to tune in to see what that's all about. Um, once I've read The Night Ocean and put this book back on the shelf, um, the Lovecraft show is going on another hiatus. But it will be back eventually. Um, I've learned that there's probably four more Lovecraft stories out there somewhere that I have not read, but they're also not available in the books that I currently have, so I'm going to need to track them down. I'm going to wait to do that for some time to do some other things. Um, we will eventually do something with his poetry. I'm not sure what. And then um, beyond all of that, I was thinking about perhaps starting a new playlist um, that it's all um, Cthulhu Mythos stories. Um, reviews by other authors. So that's where I'm going next. Um, that project would be sort of the type that's impossible to ever complete because there are at this point thousands of Cthulhu Mythos stories and novels, and it'd probably be impossible to track some of them down. But there's a lot of them that are in anthologized, um, put together in collections. 
Uh, so I may very well dive into them in the coming years, but that's a long way off um, for now. Um, we'll talk about this again um, in the next video, in the last video, the review of the Night Ocean, for which I hope that you will subscribe and tune in. But until next time, keep it creepy.